Yes, Mr. Good afternoon. Uh, I was going to start with round one. Um, and just to remind the uh, court that before the upper tribunal, um, the LLP's only case on, on this um, issue was that all of the expenditure of £153 million odd was paid for the relevant interest. Um, that was their sole case. There was no case that any part of it was paid. The LLPs had to establish that case before the upper tribunal in a, in a normal way. If the LLPs had thought that evidence as to the way in which certain of their witnesses consider the LLPs were paying for the what they were paying for was relevant, uh, then that's evidence that they should have called before the UT um, in the first first hearing. Because that was clearly would have been relevant to their case which was it was all paid for the relevant interest. It, it didn't matter what the um, analysis was of, of, the, of, the, of what, what the rest of it was paid for. Um, that would have been fundamental to their case. So they, they can't say now that, that if they understood the precise um, the way that the upper tribunal was going to decide the case, that they would have called different evidence um, as to what the, the sum was paid for. That was the essential case that they were putting forward before the upper tribunal. Um, the upper tribunal was entitled then to consider all the evidence for them and come to the conclusion that the 153 million was not all paid for the relevant interest. Well, I, I see the force of that argument in relation to the appeal, but mm -hmm. I think Miss uh, Shaw's real point was that the scope of the JR would have been broadened if they had known that HMRC was going to take the view which the yeah. tribunal ultimately did. Okay, shall I deal with that? Uh, and to do that, you, we need to look at, which we haven't yet, the judicial review uh, and what the scope of it was. Can I, can I hand you up um, these two um, documents, one of which is are, are the, um, the, the grounds of the judicial review, and the other is... Um, an email from the, tri the upper tribunal setting out um, a, a direction or a decision that Judge Sinfield made in relation to disclosure. I'll, I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, I can just hand these up. And, and you'll see, when we look, we look at the grounds, you'll see that the grounds of the judi judicial review... Yeah, yeah, have got these. Ah, yeah. They have been emailed yeah. to you, I hope. They have been emailed, have they? Yes. Right. Oh, right. Sorry. If they've been emailed, I'll find them. Okay. Have they been emailed? No. All right. Just about. To, oh, just about to. Be. I'm sorry. My, sorry, my lord. Thank you. Um. And what what we need to look at um, in this is paragraph. If you go to paragraph 57. 57? Yeah. Which sums up what they've been saying before. In short, they say, the agreed position was that where the purchase price could be treated as including an amount that was referable to rental support arrangements, the full purchase price, less the land value, would be treated as paid for the relevant interest. So that, that's what they were alleging. And if you look across at paragraph 60, where... Uh, uh, in 59 they say in short given HMRC's agreements and then in 60 they say accordingly prior to the enactment of section 10D and subsequently HMRC's position as observed and applied in practice had been that the capital allowances are available in respect to the full purchase price less the value of the land even where an element of that price is referable to rental support arrangements provided the arrangements are not unreasonable now where they are referring to rental support arrangements in the context of this case as we shall now see when we turn over the page at that stage, the LLPs were referring to all of the arrangements in this case. Oh. They were regarding them all as rental support arrangements. Because we'll see, if you look at paragraph 65, you'll see they say the LLPs arrangements were of the same type as that agreed with the MHMRC during the Zupta correspondence more particularly, and then they set that out. And in 66, they say, moreover, in reliance on that practice, the LLPs, which are taxed as ordinary partnerships for the purposes of UK law, claim that a partnership return 100% initial allowances in respect of the expenditure incurred on the acquisition of the golden contracts, less the value of the underlying site. 
So what they're saying is, at that stage, they're saying the whole of the price um, should be allowed on the basis of the revenue practice as being either for the um, for the relevant interest itself or for arrangements, rental support arrangements, that they say the revenue accepted as being part of the relevant interest. Now, the result of that was there were disclosure applications made and disclosure was given on the basis of the argument, the, the, the case, that it was the entire price which was covered by the revenues um, practice or whatever you want to call it. Um, and disclosure was given of everything that the revenue had which was relevant at all to the price paid for EZ, uh, buildings in EZA. It wasn't limited in any way. At that stage, there had been no differentiation, as there was in the upper tribunal, between the what they call the rental support arrangements, that the upper tribunal does, and the other arrangements. As I say, at that stage, the LLP was alleging that, that all of these, this whole arrangement could be regarded as a rental support arrangement. And of course, they were doing that because they wanted to get within the revenues practice in relation to rental support arrangements. Um, so disclosure was given. And the reason that I've, I've, I'm, um, I've given you the email, it's a rather informal sort of um, direction from the tribunal, but it's, it is uh, what the, tri the tribunal has been, it's been passed on by the clerk. Um, what had happened was there was an application by the uh, taxpayers in relation to disclosure, disclosure having been given the first time, where they had various points <coughs> on legal professional privilege, on um, redaction for confidentiality, which the revenue had done, and also in saying they didn't think all the documents were disclosed, whatever. Um, there was a, a very detailed statement was given by Mr. Um, Leverington, you'll see, on what had happened, what disclosure had been given, how it had been done. And, yeah. and this was the response of the upper tribunal to the application. Um, If you then, if you look, the first bit's about redactions, uh, but if you look down where it says, Judge Sinfield has considered the witness statement of the yeah. HMRC officer who coordinated the disclosure exercise, John Livington. In view of that witness statement, subject of one exception, Judge Sinfield is not satisfied the disclosure by the respondents is incomplete or that it would be appropriate to make directions for further disclosure requested. And then he refers to one exception <clears throat> where there was no witness statement from the Valuation Office Agency. Um, now that was provided subsequently, um, and there was there was some uh, question by the uh, taxpayer or application in relation to valuation office documents uh, post dating two thousand and eleven in relation to DC one, but um, that in, in the end was resolved. Um, and you'll also see about the um, there's something about the um, privileged documents where the tribunal said that they would they would look at them determine their status and that, that did happen and that was, that was resolved as well. So in short I would, I would submit they, they've made this claim in relation to the entire price, they've had disclosure on that basis, the tribunal, the upper tribunal was happy with the disclosure uh, and, that, and that's all been resolved. So in my submission there's really nothing that can be said further about this. Any attempt to ask for further disclosure um, would be essentially a collateral attack on the upper tribunal's decision at this stage in, the, in these proceedings that the disclosure had been given properly. My understanding is that everything was disclosed that could possibly be relevant to EZAs. Um, and the result of that is where the, where the judicial review ended up on the basis of that evidence was it, it only covered the rental support agreement and the other ESA uh, as defined by the tribunal yeah. in the decision. So that, that's, that's my answer to the, the judicial review um, argument. It's, it's premised on the fact that the judicial review was limited and it, <coughs> it wasn't. In fact. Um, I mean, there is a lot more history to this as to various applications, but I don't think I needed to trouble you with that or Mr. Levington's quite detailed statement as to how they gave disclosure and what, what, 
will be found. Um, so can I then turn to ground two? Yes. Yeah. So we say uh, <coughs> on ground two, and that this is a, a legal question in a sense, but we say this is a question of fact in the end, as, as Lord Hope pointed out from the, from the upper tribunal. It correctly identified the statutory test which was applying, section 296, which paid for the relevant interest. Um, and as your Lordship quite rightly pointed out, you have to always bear in mind here what the relevant interest is. It, it is, it, as we saw, is the interest. The basic relevant interest is, is the interest held by the developer. That is the, the contractual rights to have the building built in this context. So that's what you're asking. Um, this case, I, I, I hope it was obvious from the when you were looking at the case, but this is a case is different from BMBF. Um, in BMBF, there's no doubt that the bank paid. Um, 91 million for a pipeline which it had been agreed before the litigation was worth 91 million pounds what then happened what ha then happened under the arrangements was that the money was put into um, various accounts and passed through security with the effect that it repay it paid off the finance lease uh, which had been entered into um, but that doesn't affect the House of Lords said the fact that the amount was paid, the 91 million was paid for by the by the bank for the pipeline. There only was one thing it was paid for. <coughs> the <coughs> the special commissioner and Mr. Justice Park had said that the pipeline was essentially um, irrelevant. And I think Mr. Justice Park called it the fifth wheel in the cart or something like that. He said <laughs> he said essentially it could have been anything; it didn't matter. Uh, he treated it. He treated the Ramsey principle as applying in a way that allowed you to um, essentially ignore that uh, irrelevant um, matter and just look at the transaction as a whole. But the House of Lords said that was wrong, and the Court of Appeal actually before them said that was wrong. The, 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 the Ramsey approach did not allow you to do so, something like that. Uh, you had to ask, um, look at the statutory provision and ask how it applied to the facts viewed realistically. And, and in this case, in, the, in BMBF, the, the facts were that the bank bought the pipeline and acquired it, um, and then leased it under a finance lease. Um, and the arrangements behind the scenes for payment of the rent was not relevant to that. There was no question of the of the of the amount being paid for the for the for the pipeline somehow being filtered back to the bank, whereas. That was the case in Tower. Tower was a completely different case where part of it, I think 75%, ended up in a circular transaction coming back. And so there it was held that that part wasn't, wasn't expenditure on the software. It wasn't really expenditure at all when you looked at the entire transaction. However, in, in Tower, you may have seen it was recognised by Lord Walker at the end of his judgment that, strictly speaking, it may have been necessary to look further because some of the amount that was paid, that was actually paid on the face of it for the, for the um, software, which didn't go around the circle, was actually then applied in fees, etc., of the scheme. Um, the reason I, I think he decided not to pursue that uh, and simply allow 25% was the procedural history of the case which had started in the special commissioners he had given a decision which I think is recorded by Lord Walker as not following the arguments of either party um, that was overturned by the Mr Justice Henderson in the High Court on the basis that BMBF applied and the Court of Appeal upheld that and the House of Lords then reinstated the decision of the special commissioner um, but not for the same reason given. Um, it, it was critical of some of the things he decided and accepted his basic um, findings. So I think it was thought that it would be unfair to send the case back at that stage yeah. to, 
deal with that point. But that doesn't, not Lord Walker saying that that isn't the case in principle, he's just saying that in that particular case it wasn't appropriate. So, um, so the upper tribunal in this case um, analysed um, in the, the decision of what part of the arrangements actually supported the rent, they said the RSAs, what part was expenses to the arrangements. And then it, it expressed its decision on the issue at paragraphs 243 to 249. Perhaps we should just look at that. And 243 just makes the point that I was making that the LLP resisted any attempt to um, break up the price or portion it or anything. They simply said it was all paid for. But then they, they, they then go on to say, well, that misses the point because we're, the reason that it wasn't all paid for the uh, um, relevant interest is not because of what was done with the proceeds afterwards but because that was the contractual agreement. So this wasn't a case where they had agreed to pay 153 million for the relevant interest alone, uh, and then you had to decide whether that was truly what they'd agreed. On the face of the contractual documents, they'd agreed to pay the 153 million for um, a number of things, all the, all the um, benefits under the SDA you remember. So the tribunal was saying, well, on the face of the documents, that's what it says, um, face of their own contract. Uh, and so unlike BMBF, where it was all paid contractually and, and, real, and, and in reality for the pipeline, this is a case where it was paid for a whole lot of different things. And you then had to analyze, the tribunal UT thought, um, what it was paid for, so, what, what the substantial benefits were. Um, it wasn't and necessary. And how do you distinguish between such benefits and other obligations which the developer mm. undertook? I mean, you might, for instance, say, well, <clears throat> then not only uh, were the LLPs buying the golden, the um, relevant interest, they were also buying estate agency services from the developer, which under normal circumstances would have cost them 3% of the rent or whatever it yes. might be. But I, 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 in my submission, that, that must be a question of, of fact and evaluation for the tribunal because you're, you're always going to get that kind of, likely to get that kind of problem with um, contracts where you're paying for a, a lot of things. Um, but the tribunal is entitled to take the view that some of these things are actually bound up in the, are actually bound up in, say, the relevant interests or whatever. For instance, the provision of the documents that my other friend pointed to. Yes, um, well, that I can see. That, that yes. really is just the mechanics of handing everything over. Yes. But, um, and and the, estate the estate agency might be. Estate agency services are a bit different. Well, they might be or they might not be. But um, I, I would I would submit that the nature of the exercise that you carry out in this, uh, in deciding how to split things out, depends to some extent on the statutory provisions that you're you're looking at because hmm. there may be I mean the examples you were giving about um, washing machines and warranties etc there may be some statutory con context in which you do have to split out <laughs> whether you're paying for the washing machine or the, or the, or the warranty or the, or the insurance I mean VAT for instance can often often you have to split out transactions that are a package into different elements um, but you but let's take VAT I mean there are as you may know, there's exemptions, your rating, yeah. and standard rating. Um, if everything's standard rated, then you don't have to split it out, maybe. Um, if, if some particular element was exempt, then you'd have to try and identify that element and split that out, because that's relevant to the VAT analysis. But you wouldn't have to split out all the other elements, because they're not relevant. Um, so the question would be in any particular statutory context. Um, what's the appropriate approach to take? 
And I, I think it's common ground that, they pr that the statutory question is what did these taxpayers pay for the relevant, for the developer's interest on the <coughs> golden contract? Exactly, yes. That's a statutory question. Yes. And, and at this stage in the uh, an analysis, of course, you don't have to um, split out anything. I mean, that, that comes at the, the next stage. All you have to decide is they didn't pay at all for the relevant interest. Yeah. That's all that they were being. That's all that they were deciding at this stage. They didn't pay all of it for the relevant interest because that was the taxpayer's case. Uh, when you then come to the um, question about what's what's paid for the relevant interest and what, what the amount is, then you might have to consider the questions that your, your lordship is weighing and whether the um, whether the state agency services are part of the relevant interest or whether they're not. Yeah. Um, in this context, that's what you have to decide. But I mean, jumping ahead, all, what I say is that all, all they had to decide at the third stage, you know, when you get to ground three, was what was paid for the relevant interest. Yeah. Because that's a statutory question. Um, in some cases, it may be helpful to try and value the other elements um, to do that. Um, and, and Bostock is an example. If, can I just say something about Bostock? Um, do you remember Bostock? Was yeah, you, you haven't, have you finished ground two or not? No, I haven't, but I think it's relevant to right. talking about ground two because Bos Bostock shows a case where you do have to, you do have to um, look at each asset individually um, because, and the reason for that is because of marriage value, I think. Mm. Land, land with a building on it is worth more than the land or the building separately. But the tax legislation... So what they did was they valued the, the land separately, the building separately, but those wouldn't add up to the whole value. So they had to decide, it was necessary in that case to decide how the marriage value was to be apportioned. That's what they, that's what they were doing in Bostock essentially, because there were two separate identifiable mm. assets. Um, that's, not, that's not this case, um, we, don't, we don't have that aspect in this case because you cannot cannot say that um, there's a marriage value between the various items in that, in that sense. Um, I'm sorry, I was just um, dealing with 243 to 249. Yeah. Um, and they, they then uh, deal with um, BMBF and Tower, as I've, as I've said. And they point out that they're not basing the decision in 246 on circularity of funds. Um, and then they reject 247, the revenues argument, um, which was really based on a follow the money kind of approach, I think it's fair to say, looking at where the money went um, as opposed to what it was paid for. Um, um, and then they, they um, having concluded in, in 249, uh, sorry, having concluded that they're, they're not all paid for the relevant interest, they then go on to look at what the various interests <laughs> were and whether they were analogous to warranties or a tax deed. Now, what I would say about this is, um, my learned friend is very keen on this idea of warranty for of value and says, well, that's the key to all of this. Um, you have to be very careful, though, because there are different types of warranty of value. Uh, the type that's being mentioned in a share sale is, is a warranty by the seller, essentially, that the shares are as as seen, as they've been, uh, the, or the company is, as it's been um, um, uh, made out to be by the seller at the time of the sale. It's not warranting what will happen in the future. It's simply saying, we're selling you these shares, this company, we've told you that there's nothing wrong with the company. This is our warranty that the company is, hasn't got any skeletons in the cupboard, there aren't any problems with tax or whatever <coughs> that you don't know about, <coughs> or claims that we've made against us, or contaminated land that, that we know about but we haven't told you about, whatever. It's all about the simply saying, we're, 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 we're being completely open with you, this, and if we're not, then we have to we have to compensate you um, for the value mm -hmm. now. What, what we've got in this case, though, is a different kind of warranty of value. Uh, if 
That's a way of describing it. it. It's something which is guaranteeing the future value, well into the future. Guaranteeing it in the sense that it's, um, it doesn't change the value of the land or the building. If you sold the building on its own, it would be still the same value. Uh, but it, it changes the value of the building in a sense in your hands because you have these other agreements. Um, so it's a future um, so kind of guarantee. So just as if I, if someone sold me shares um, and, and also agreed that they would buy them back at a certain price in three years time, well that would be, an, that would be guaranteeing the value of the shares in my hands because I know that in three years time I can sell them back at that, at that value, whatever happens to them. You might then say if I pay an amount for the shares and, and that promise, that part of what I'm paying could be said for the promise. Because I might be paying more than I would pay for the shares normally. It's a warranty of value in some sense, but it's, it's actually a valuable <coughs> asset. And, and I would submit that's that's the position here with the, with all the various financial but products. I suppose we have. putting it slightly differently, what the developer had was the right under the golden contract to have the building built. Um, and it also had a lease. So no doubt, once the building was built, it would have been able to let the building. And the developer's interest at that stage carried whatever risks there were in terms of changes in values, not finding a tenant and all the rest of it. Yeah. And the, let's call them the, additional elements of the SDA and the services agreement de-risked that. Yes. Well, to, to whatever extent it was that yeah. provided for. That's right. So the person who um, was buying the land and the building was also getting agreements that would contract contractual rights which would allow them yeah, to um, obtain payments in the future which would yeah, remove the risk in some sense but um, would actually be quite different from the land because it wouldn't be it wouldn't be doing anything to land, improving the land I mean it, it's, it's, it's related to the land in the sense that it, in some sense sometimes it, some of the agreements are related to them because they depend on the rental from the land whether it's lower or higher some of them, the CRSA type arrangements really are nothing to do with the land in a sense they're to do with Finance to buy the land. And that's that's the that's the point about this CRSA. Um, what 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 the what the um, developer agrees to do is to to um, deposit a, a large amount of money in an account, which will be part of the amount that repays the loan, where um, which is going to happen when the tenant is found. Although it could happen before then. I mean, the problem with the uh, looking at the value of this, and I put this to some of the witnesses in, in, the, in the cross examination in the second hearing, was that there was risks being taken by the developer mm. in this um, that the bank might call in the loan before the tenant was found. Now that hasn't actually, I understand, that hasn't actually happened, but th that could have could happen, and then the developer would would be in some difficulty, um, and so all of that kind of risk you've got to you've got to feed into the. Equation. But that's a risk that falls on the shoulders of the developer as opposed mm. to the purchaser. Yes. Or the assignee. Yeah. Um, the the assignee, uh, or, or the, yeah, well, the assignee of the uh, contract and the, the contract. And yeah. the, <laughs> yes. And the contracting party under the SDA who gets yeah. the benefit of all of this. Yes. That's right. And it also benefits the bank, I suppose, as well, because it means mm. that uh, their, their risk is negligible. So they, they can. They lent at 0.5 percent, I think, because of, because of that. But essentially, the money was still there, and in fact, I think it was probably deposited with them. So I think they were pretty safe um, in getting it back, um, which may be why they don't recall the loan. Um, but anyway, that's my point. Is that you cannot simply say simply because this these contractual rights um, are are are, are a in some sense, um, affect 
affect the value of the land in your hands in the future. You can. That the, the, you're then paying for, paying for the relevant interest or paying the money for part of the relevant interest, essentially, when you're, when you're acquiring those rights. They, they, they're, not, they're not part of the relevant interest. It might be different. <coughs> My Lord, I think you gave an example um, supposing that the developer actually entered into a lease and paid rent until um, a tenant was found. Now that might be different because then that would actually be essentially part of the land interest or the, or the building interest because it would be it would be a lease of the, of the building which would be which would mean you have a building let at a rent rather than a building non let. So that might that might actually be different, but the other way that might actually mean that that would affect the value of the relevant interest. But simply to um, agree that you'll pay an amount equal to the rent, um, depending on what rent is achieved, doesn't affect the value of the the, of the building. Except, except you might say, in that it makes it more attractive for the uh, LLPs to acquire the building, mm. <coughs> but it doesn't affect the, the value of it. You, you only have to ask the question: What would happen if you sold the building? See. Well, the question is not so much whether it would affect the value of it; it's the question of um, whether it would affect the price that is to be paid for the interest in it. Yes, or whether, <laughs> or whether. Well, that's a kind well, of part of the price. Yes, whether part of the price would be paid for that. Right. You're right. The, yes. the, 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 I can well see that you can say that a purchaser would be prepared to pay a premium in respect of land that's already tenanted um, because you know they've got an income stream coming in. But they're not prepared to pay more for um, a building um, just because um, you've got you happen to have a contractual right from somebody to. Um, Get payments in the future. You'd have to assign the contractual right along with the building. Yeah. <coughs> Which I think demonstrates that they're actually not yeah. not the same. But what, what, what the legislation is about is about <coughs> is about getting relief on buildings, building buildings. And acquiring buildings that have been built or in, or extended extend, extended to acquiring the right to have buildings built. That's what I'm saying now. Is that of course what I say. The legal position is I quite accept that as a result of the judicial review, it's necessary to treat the um, RSAs and ESAs as part of the real, essentially as part of the relevant interest, but. The argument here is not, is that right? But the argument is, what's the position with the CRSAs? And essentially we say that because the, what they said about the RSAs we'd say is wrong. I, I think I'm able to say that, despite the fact we didn't get permission to appeal it on the grounds it was academic, because it's not, I'm not challenging the decision. <laughs> I'm saying as a, a response to um, what's being said by them, the other side. Just well, as the other side. what I put to Ms. Shaw, in, insofar as she's relying on inconsistency of treatment. Yes, exactly. Uh, I can see that you may be able to say, well, there is an inconsistency, but the inconsistency is they got the RSAs wrong. But yeah. uh, I don't think you can ask us to decide it, so to speak, as an independent point. I wasn't. I wasn't asking you to to do that. I mean, that, the point that Lady Justice Asplin I think made was that although it was an arguable, you know. It w she would have granted permission otherwise, hmm. I think. Uh, she thought it was academic. Uh, because, because of the, the JR. <laughs> we did point out in, in our application that if, if, the, um, uh, if the taxpayers were given permission on their point, because we knew that they were relying on the, <laughs> they were relying on an extension of the RSA point, that that, that might cause us a problem. But um, yeah. uh, it wouldn't be academic in, that, in a sense then. Um, but I, I think we're, I think we're able to. I'm able to say this that in fact that's not the correct legal analysis. Although I'm not attacking the the decision yeah. that was made on RSAs. Um, 
I mean, we're in just the same position with the ESAs. I think my learned friend is saying essentially that's wrong. Although there isn't, you know, you can't really appeal that because it's academic as well because of the GIA, judicial review. Um, so I think we're, we're both saying <coughs> that <laughs> the decision on uh, on RSAs or ESAs is wrong for the tribunal. Um, although it's academic. So, so my, my submission is that, that that's the reason why um, the, the, the CRSAs cannot be regarded as part of the relevant interest. Um, they're very far from it. Um, the, the, the RSAs are obviously closer because of the link to the rent, <coughs> but these CRSAs are simply a, me a method of securing the, the loan and the finance. And to, to describe it as um, bolstering the capital value, I would submit is not really uh, a realistic way of looking at it. The, the capital value of the building will fluctuate depending on market conditions. It um, won't be affected by the CRSA. I turn then to ground three. Were you going to deal with the arrangement fee? The arrangement fee? Well, um, I wasn't going to because I thought that was <laughs> pretty obviously not not part of the relevant interest. I mean, it was it's a distinct um, element that can be recognised. And the fact they, they, I think the tribunal said we didn't have to value it because we know what it was. Um, that, that was what was being paid for, the, for that fee was what the fee actually was. Um, it's hard to see that would be a error of law to include that. Because you understand behind all of this is the, is the question of whether <coughs> um, if there was no error, error in principle, no error of um, in what the test was, <coughs> that it would be necessary to show that the, what the tribunal decided was one that something no reasonable tribunal could have decided on, yeah. the, on the evidence. Uh, and we say that in the light of clause whatever it is, clause two of the SDA, that's a hopeless um, yeah. hmm. submission in the facts of this case. All right, ground three. Uh, ground three. Of what I think underpins the whole, all, all the real complaints in ground three <coughs> are one proposition, which is that you have to look at what the LLPs thought they were doing in deciding this, what they thought they were paying and that that's critical but the problem with that is that factually we know that they thought they were paying the whole amount for the relevant interest mm. that's the basis of their claim for allowances on the whole 153 million so it, it, it's not real to say that you can somehow discern from the evidence of, of their advisors carrying out a cross check that they were that they thought they were paying some amounts for um, the building the relevant interest however you define that they simply weren't and that's the point the tribunal I think were making upper tribunal were making when they said there wasn't any negotiation of the of the price it was 153 million take it or leave it and it was and it was represented as being 153 million for the relevant interest because that's what you, you got the allowances on the part the um, the because of that of course the LLPs weren't concerned with how you split it out because they thought it was all the relevant interest And therefore, they'd get 100% allowances on the whole lot. So we, we would submit it's not possible to untangle. It was right. The tribunal were right 
the very least, they were reasonable. They made a reasonable decision. But the, this was not a case where you could untangle what the um, purchaser, well, the, the LLPs, thought they were paying uh, for a particular element of the transaction. We've got. We've now got to the stage where we've we've succeeded on we've succeeded on ground two. So we're assuming mm. that that it's not all paid for the relevant interest. So it's not possible to determine that because that's not a question that they asked themselves. Because they knew that they had all these other um, financial arrangements around it. So it was a rather meaningless question to them. Um, what are you paying for the building? Um, because <coughs> they didn't mind because they, they were protected in all these different ways. But when we come to ground three, then it is a question which the tribunal has to ask. And I would submit that it was a reasonable approach to take, if not perhaps the only practical approach, to base their decision on market values. And, and therefore you're, you're taking them to have paid the market value for uh, the relevant interest. Now, it's artificial, I understand, but then in a case where the, the parties haven't themselves turned their mind to these matters expri explicitly, Inevitably, the exercise is, a, is going to be an um, artificial one to some extent. Um, you can't. Um, ju ju just as in, I suppose, in, in, in Bostock, if you remember, uh, nobody, th nobody thought to ask what the parties thought they were paying for. Nobody thought to ask, well, what, did they think they were paying so much for the land and so much for the building? Mm -hmm. It would have been a meaningless question to ask. True. <laughs> um, the only way of dealing with that is by looking at the market values, the relative market values of the two of the two uh, elements. And we would say that's the only, well, I don't have to say it's the only, but I would, think I would say it's the only practical. Well, you say it was, a, it was a reasonable proxy. It's a reasonable, yeah, exactly. You have to come to some decision. You have to do it somehow. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, and, and it, it's necessary in cases like this. I mean, my other friend's obviously quite right. If, you're, if you've got an arm's length transaction where you're buying a Ming vase and, and it's clear that you're paying the million pounds for the Ming vase and there's no other funny business going on or arrangements behind the scenes, then you've paid a million pounds for the Ming vase in whatever it's worth. It doesn't matter. Of course, that, that, that's right. But that's, that's not this case. No. Um, if you're paying a million pounds for a Ming vase and a refrigerator, then you might have a question as to what you were paying what for. Um, it used to be under the Shops Act when there was restricted trading on Sunday. You could go into a furniture shop and buy a bag of carrots for £200 and they'd give you a free sofa. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness, I'd love to hear what Customs and Excise thought of that. <laughs> VAT. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, that kind of thing, perhaps not in that extreme, does happen in VAT. We, we, we may have come across these issues <coughs> where, uh, where the people are, they, they get a package of goods for, for a price. Um, uh, yeah, so we would say that's, the, that's in fact the only approach, but it's certainly not an unreasonable approach for the, for the tribunal to take. Um, because if, uh, and the alternative would be to try and decide what the taxpayers thought they were doing. Um, now again, we didn't have, actually, even if that was a relevant question, we didn't have any evidence mm -hmm. at the second stage. The taxpayers could have called you know, LOP members or those who are running it to say, this is what we thought we were paying for, but they, they didn't do that. So there, there wasn't any very clear evidence that they thought they were paying X amount for the, uh, for the land. Um, I think the reason for that is because they didn't ever consider that question. Well, they thought they were paying the price, a whole of the price for the land. Hmm? Point. They well, would they, no doubt have said that they thought they were paying the whole of the price for the land. Well, they certainly thought they were paying it all for the relevant interest. Mm. <laughs> yes, 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 exactly. Yeah. They would say it was all for the, all well, for the building. Well, I think we know that they thought they were paying a pound for the land. 
for the yes, yes for the for the, um, the lease. Yeah, that was because it was at a right rent. I think. Yes, point. Yeah. I understand. Yes, they thought of paying a pound for the lease and and um, and um, whatever it was, yeah. one hundred fifty three million for the relevant interest, which was uh, the building with all the ancillary. Yeah, add-ons for that. Um, the um, so that in a, in a sense that that's kind of an answer to I think most of the points my friend made because they all started from the proposition that you had to be looking at what the, it was essential to look at from the point of view of the um, LLPs. So I, I think that's why my friend said the appropriate starting point. Uh, it couldn't be what the tribunal decided. Well, she had another way of putting it as well, and that was that if if these elements, as I'll call them, were separate enough to be separately treated, then they should each have been separately valued. They can't be separate enough to be separately treated, but not separate enough to be separately valued. They, they were, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I, yes, I understand that. But... I think I think the tribunal were talking about two different things there. They were where they were talking in the first decision about whether they were separate. They were talking about whether they were identifiable set of rights which were independent of the um, the land or the, or the building, um, and therefore weren't just part of the building or part of the ancillary to the building. Um, it, but here they were addressing really the, the difficulty um, that there was of untangling. Despite that, the difficulty of untangling these rights, um, and particularly when you look at the EZAs, um, because you, you run into a problem about of kind of circularity, because the more that you attribute to the uh, the, the the more you say that the uh, it's attributed to the uh, relevant interest, the greater are the EZAs. Um, and the less, the lesser are the EZAs, which are then shared. Um, so the, the, the it, it does run into a problem when you try to value the CRSAs as a sort of standalone asset, because the, the the value of them may depend on the amount of the EZAs, and the amount of the EZAs depends on the value of the CRSAs. That was a kind of problem that the, the experts I think had. So there was a certain amount of there's a very intertwined transactions. Mm. Um, I, I, I think that was what they were getting at when they were talking about that in the second decision. They were simply, they were simply saying it, it, it wasn't very easy to come to a valuation of them on a standalone basis. Because um, once you did that, you then had to apportion it. With, Say weightably, that increased the um, relevant value, relevant the amount of paid for the relevant interest, proportionally, which increased the amount of the EZAs, um, which had an effect on the CRSAs. So it was kind of a you know, difficult loop to get out of. Yeah. But I think you say, you say, don't you, that the statutory question is what did the LLPs pay for the relevant interest? Yes. Um, there wasn't direct evidence of what they thought they paid. So the tribunal were at least reasonable in taking market value as the proxy and adjusting it in an appropriate way as they did. And once they had identified what the LLPs paid for the relevant interest, their task was at an end. Exactly. That's right, and, it, and it's not a case like Bostock where there would be a marriage value of some kind between that and the other asset that you had to somehow um, take account of. Mm. Essentially, I think Mr. Mackey, his evidence, the ex uh, expert called by HMRC, was essentially the, the best way to do this, to value the CRSAs with a residual value approach, he called it, which was essentially what's left over. That, that's what they're, mm. that's what you'd value them at, because of the difficulties in actually valuing them as a standalone asset. Um, so exactly, that, that, that's what I would say. Um, 
then we have the uh, so they, they, they <coughs> also have complaints about the value the way they valued the, the benefit of the EZAs and, and, and how they were to be split I think between the, the parties um, valuing the benefit well they, this was a 10% discount which I think the tribunal gave on the basis that there was they, they estimated that someone would take the view that there was a 10% chance they wouldn't get the EZAs um, at all of course that's what we're arguing about in uh, our appeal yeah. in this case um, and that was dealt with in the, the second decision at paragraph 41 This, this again was a this was a matter for the for the tribunal to decide as a question of fact. They they, they said first of all it's common sense that a hypothetical purchaser of an asset in an EZ would recognise that um, if the chosen means of sharing involved adding an amount to the upfront purchase price, the purchaser alone would take all the risk. These EZs would not be allowed. Um, then you accept that a hypothetical purchaser would have been aware there was at least some risk that these EZs would have been allowed. The investors and the LLPs were undoubtedly taking the risk that because the LLPs were acquiring a package of assets in addition to the relevant interest, the whole of the price would not be characterised as qualifying expenditure. Um, however, that is irrelevant to the present question because a purchase of the GC rights would not have presented that risk. Nevertheless, a hypothetical purchaser market value in 2011 would still be taking some risk that EZAs would not be available given the timing of the transactions. The EZ at the site came to an end in 2006 purchasers of the GC rights would only successfully claim uh, um, the EZAs of the developer and incurred expenditure and construction under a golden contract and there was room for doubt as to whether this requirement was met which is as I say is our, the ground of our appeal uh, then they accepted Mr Mackey didn't have the expertise to suggest a purchaser would discount it by 20% then they say there's no scientific basis for calculating the amount of the deduction it's not a question of when the evidence that experts can assist evaluative judgment the litigation risk is notoriously difficult to quantify uh, but they give a 10 percent but with 10 percent 10 percent and we would say that's right i mean they're right the tribunal is it's a question for the tribunal in the end the tribunal being a tribunal of lawyers <laughs> are, are presumably at least as good a, a position as an expert who's not a lawyer in fact to um to estimate litigation risk um, of the risk of not getting the EZAs, particularly as they already heard the appeal <laughs> on the issue, so they would be very aware of all the issues and, and, the, and the, their, their evaluation of the strength of them. So we would say that they were perfectly entitled to come to that conclusion, uh, and it, it, it doesn't matter that the experts may come to different conclusions or. The, uh, the um, LLP's expert came to a different conclusion and Mr Mackey came to a different conclusion which they've uh, effect, which they've uh, expressly um, discounted so we would say the 10% ten, the ten was justifiable uh, was reasonable at least and equally the 50-50 split um, of the EZAs was a perfectly reasonable decision in the facts. I mean, they, there was some debate as to who had the stronger bargaining power, and I think the tribunal came to the conclusion that you couldn't really tell that. All you could tell is they both had some bargaining power. Um, it was coming to the end of the, the period. Um, on the other hand, that, that cuts both ways because mm. that, that meant that they. The, yeah. um, the developer needed well, to sell. Well, 50 is a very common split of marriage value in um, yeah. yes. in um, enfranchisement cases, for instance. Yeah. There's no, no reason to think that, um, that that wouldn't be reasonable here between the parties as to what they would have taken to have negotiated if they, if they had negotiated it. Um, you also, I mean, you have to remember that although this, this was ending, uh, and therefore the developer couldn't sell and of course people couldn't get into it afterwards there were a lot of other tax schemes around um, for people to enter into so 
this wasn't the only one. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't as if those who were going to enter into this had nothing else they could do in society um, or, or invest in. Mm. So you can't assume that they were even necessarily as desperate as the developer would be to get the transaction in now. I, I quite take my learned friend's point that people wanted to get into this if they could. Um, but if they couldn't, then there were other, other options, obviously. Um, and again, I think any argument that it all depended on what they thought or, or how they looked at it but actually um, is really rather unrealistic because the, the parties didn't, the LNPs didn't undermine sort of how they would share the EZAs. As far as they were concerned, they were getting them all <laughs> on the on the hundred fifty three million. So they, th this is not what this is this exercise that's been carried out in in valuing <coughs> is not based on what actually happened. Mm. It's a it's a it's an imaginary exercise. I think those were all the points I was trying to make in response to. Uh, right. Thank you, Mr. Ewart. Well, there's just one point uh, of housekeeping. I was just wanting to check Lord Justice Lewis and Lord Lewis, the court had, had actually received the, our skeletons in the, the supplemental the, one. Well, all three of them. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I, 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 ha I did receive your supplemental right, okay. electronically. I now have a hard copy of it as well. Okay. I'm, still, I'm still searching for mine. Um, my clerk couldn't find it anywhere, and we've had printouts of the others. Okay. For some reason, um, it hasn't cut through to me. I don't know why, but we have had a good search. Okay. It's very odd. I'll, I'll get a copy from my lord. Okay. What I was really concerned about was that you had actually received them all. Yes, yes, I, oh, yes, yes. That's the only one that's missing from mine. I've yeah, got a complete right. suite of everything. Because I think you'd asked for them in um, electronic forms. Yes, I yeah. did indeed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mum. Yes, Ms. Shaw. Just a, a couple of points uh, in reply on each on each ground, if I may. Um, so, firstly, in terms of the disclosure exercise um, that was conducted in relation to the to the JR, um, self evidently that disclosure exercise was tied to the grounds, um, and in our submission, the grounds are very clearly limited to the RSAs. Um, so, paragraphs fifty one. 57, 60, 62. Sorry, just hold on a bit more steady. Paragraphs 51, 51, 57, yeah. 60, yeah. 62, 65, 72.2. Mm -hmm. They are all paragraphs relating to RSAs. Nowhere is there any mention of CRSAs. So we say that, of course, the revenue engaged with the disclosure exercise on the basis of what it was that was in dispute for the purposes of the JR. That was limited to the RSAs and did not include the CRSAs. Um, and the second point is we, we, we also don't know what Mr. Watson um, and the other witnesses would have, what evidence they would have wished to give in relation to the revenues practice on CRSAs. Um, the second point in, in reply to, to uh, my learned friend's submissions on ground one is that the fact that our case was that all of the price was paid for the relevant interest doesn't mean uh, that we're expected to meet any and every uh, argument as to what else it is said the relevant in, uh, that the price was paid. The revenues case was that the price had also been paid for a number of specified items, uh, many of which fell away over the course of, of the hearing. And, and as we've seen, the upper tribunal's approach was to specify the other items for which it was said the price had been paid. 
So it cannot be right, we say, that we are expected to, if you like, um, predict in advance what it is going, what is going to be suggested that we paid part of the price for. We cannot possibly have guessed that it would be said that we paid part of the price for the developer loan uh, or the right of conversion or indeed the collateral because it was not suggested until we received the decision that that is what we paid the price for. So the upper tribunal made the point, which seems a fair point, that having decided that there were these separate benefits, yeah. you would have the opportunity to explain at the second hearing what it was that you paid for. Well, we had the opportunity to adduce further evidence as to the value uh, of those elements, but we, we never had an opportunity to adduce evidence, in particular, in relation to the revenues practice. No, I, I understand revenues practice, which, as I said to you right at the beginning, doesn't seem to me to be relevant to the appeal, but I can see it might be very relevant to the JR. Yeah. Now, I thought this the point you're just making in response to Mr. Ewart is to do with the appeal, not the JR. Well, it, uh, uh, and, well it's, it's to do with both, but yes, it is to do with the appeal. And, and in my submissions, I, I showed you the evidence from Mr. Yeah. Fielding and Mr. Pulford, yes. and I said that is the sort of evidence we would have wished to adduce yes. in relation to the appeal. But by that point, the ship had sailed. Yeah. So, so we, were, we weren't given the opportunity to adduce that evidence. <coughs> So in, in, in relation to ground two, um, my learned friend says that whether or not you split out the various elements and uh, divide the price between them depends on the statutory context. And he gave the example in VAT. He said, oh, well, in VAT, you might split out the price between, say, the asset and, and, and the warranty. But of course, in VAT, the answer is you don't split out the price in relation to ancillary elements. There's a single multiple supply question is predicated on that. If, if an element is properly to be regarded as ancillary, you don't split split the price. And, and, and we say there's nothing in the statutory context here to suggest that you have yeah. to <coughs> split out ancillary elements. Um, the revenue also describe um, the arrangements here as, as a warranty of future value and, and we say that's wrong um, what the arrangements here guarantee is that if at some point in the future the data centers don't generate the rental income that has been suggested ie 170 pounds per square foot or if they don't have a sufficient capital value to enable the debt to be repaid, then the developer is going to step in. So in other words, if it subsequently turns out that the rental value or the capital value is less than has been presented, then the developer is on the hook in just the same way that a vendor of, of shares is guaranteeing that if at some point down the line, it turns out that the company isn't worth what the vendor has indicated it's worth. The vendor has to step in. Uh, and finally on ground, ground two, we say that the fact that the relevant interest is worth more because of the arrangements again doesn't mean that you've you should be regarded as having paid part of the price for those arrangements so to return to the example of shares with a warranty of value shares with a warranty are obviously worth more than shares without a warranty but we say you still still would not say that what the purchaser is paying for is the warranty. They are paying for the shares and that, that comes with the benefit of the warranty. Um, 
um, and then finally ground three we say that it's not fair to say that the LLPs didn't mind what they paid for the building. We know from the factual findings that the value which the LLPs ascribed to the building was Watson value one, because that was the value to which they looked when assessing the price. That was the value which they asked BTZ to provide them with. And that was the value at which they wrote down the value of the investment in their accounts. And we say neither the upper tribunal nor the revenue explain why if that is the value to which the LLPs looked, that isn't the appropriate starting point. Uh, and then finally, uh, we say that the revenue don't explain why it's not appropriate to value each of the elements. If they are separate for the purposes of 296, then why is it not appropriate to value each of those separate elements? It certainly wasn't the case that the question of value was too hard the upper tribunal had the expert evidence on it. The reason why the upper tribunal didn't do it is because it didn't regard it as necessary. They don't offer a convincing reason as to why that is the case. Those are all my points in reply. Well, first of all, may I congratulate you both for having finished this case a day earlier than predicted. Um, now, can I just go through the various permutations? Um, if we allow HMRC's appeal, then the points raised in the LLP's appeal don't seem to arise, do they? I don't think so. That's right. right. So, obviously, we'll consider the Clause 12 Respondent's Notice point in the context of of um, HMRC's appeal. Um, if we were to go down that road, what order should we make on the LLP's appeal? No order, or dismiss it, or what? Do something. I'm just thinking ahead. There was an appeal mm. against. If, if you were to decide in our favour on ground one, and not and not and, and then and then say no order on ground two, then it's to the Supreme Court. Well, I mean, we could um, we could have an order saying no order, no order which, which would be an order that could be appealed against. Okay. It would then have to. Or we would. Or we could declare that the points raised didn't arise, or yeah. something. Yes. Yeah. I'm not suggesting we stay silent. Yeah. Just a question of what form it should take. Yeah. Well, if, if you want to think about it a bit more, Miss Shaw, then just drop us a note somewhere or another. I'll, if, I'll do that, thank you. All right. If we dismiss HMRC's appeal, that's straightforward, we just dismiss it. If we allow the LLP's appeal on ground one, then grounds two and three don't arise, is that right? Uh, save as to the arranger, Steve. So Save as to the arranger's fee. In, in ground two. Oh. oh. That was always an issue, was it? Yes. All right. so, so I've got to make a note of that. So ground one excludes the arranger's fee. But yes, it does, yeah. Not, so ground, not sure I'd gra fully appreciate that. Ground I, I one is that, is that the upper tribunal shouldn't have... Um, reached a decision that part of the price was payable for the CRSAs. Yes. Right. Okay. So it's limited. So that to leaves open the issue of the arrangement right. fee. Right. Right. Only C. Okay. Only CRSA. Right. Yes. See, um, see footnote seven in our skeleton. Yeah. If we dismiss on ground one but allow on ground two. Yeah. Uh, then ground three doesn't arise. I think. Does it?
So ground three. Is it no. Yeah. Ground three. Is that entirely dependent on losing on ground two, or does the arranger's fee slip through that one too? No. So if we win on ground two, but the arranger's fee is ancillary, then no, no valuation. Yeah. But if if you lose on if you lose on ground two, we then move on to ground three. Yep. So my, my question was, if you win on ground two, does any of ground three arise? No. No. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you for that clarification. And if you want to give us a bit further thought of what the order might actually say in the event that we were to allow HMRC's appeal. Yeah, that would be helpful. Well, the final permutation is surely if we dismiss grounds one and two but allow ground three, what do we do about it? And that would be the question of whether it goes back to the upper tribunal or whether we grapple with it ourselves. Yes. I think it's a matter for you. Um, <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, so I, I think it probably is. Yes. And, and, and uh, speaking or thinking aloud, um, in the event that we do decide to grapple with it, I think we would have to invite further submissions. I don't think we just yeah. plunge into the papers and work it out for ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It will not surprise you to learn. Mr. Williams, did you want to say something? Uh, my Lord, uh, not of any great substance, but just uh, we did undertake yesterday we were trying to provide the court with a more legible version of oh, the, the, the plan. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. And that could be handed up. Yeah. Uh, and just, this is a more, <laughs> uh, this is a more legible version of the plan, which is, which I think we looked at in bundle, uh, supplementary bundle B, tab 21, page 809, which is part of works option one. Bundle, just give me that again, reference. It's, uh, Supplementary B. bundle B, tab 21, page 809. Thank you. Oh, yes, we've got some nice oh, coloured numbers. Indeed. This, is, this <laughs> has gone by email to Lord Justice Newey. And, and just to note, there are, there are three new buildings under this workshop, option, and we've been able to identify and highlight numbers 34 and 66. We haven't been able to legibly show uh, building 65. So all one can really say about it, it, it isn't on the site of either building yeah. 34 or 66, but it is somewhere else on the general site. Right. I, I, hope, I hope that's of some assistance. Right. Well, as I was saying, it won't surprise you to learn that we will reserve our judgments. Uh, you will get a draft judgment in the usual way. It now comes with a very much beefed up embargo, which means exactly what it says, and any breach of the embargo may be treated with contempt of court draft will be circulated to those whose email addresses appear on our lists, which you gave to, I think, my clerk before the hearing began. Uh, it will be the solicitor's responsibility to distribute the judgments insofar as they are permitted to be further distributed for the purpose of taking instruction and so on. On receipt of the draft judgment, we will expect you to uh, agree any necessary typographical errors, uh, corrections, factual nature and so on, you will know this is not an opportunity to re-argue the case or to take new points, and we would hope, particularly in the light of the discussion that we have just had, that you will be able to agree a form of order in the light of the draft judgment. Uh, we will then arrange to hand it down, uh, as you will also know, hand downs these days are all done electronically, so there will be no need for any further attendance. Thank you all very much for your very helpful and coaching argument.